Today on the channel, we are talking about this, the Sharkbite digital FPV system from Fat Shark. And in this video, I'm gonna give you guys an overview of the system, take a close look at the hardware, take a look at the menus, the system itself, a little bit of footage from it to show you how it actually looks. And then at the end of the video, I'm gonna give you my thoughts having spent a bit of time with it. Now, I just wanna say this system was actually lent to me by one of you guys, one of my subscribers, very kindly lent me this system to try out. Fat Shark have not sent me this to make a review on. I just want to say a massive thank you to that person who has done this. This video would not have been possible without your support. Now, the first thing we're going to do is take a closer look at the hardware. We'll then jump into the menus and then I'll give you my thoughts at the end. Sharkbite is the latest version of the digital FPV system from Fat Shark. It has many improvements over Bite Frost and it consists of three main parts. The first is a digital FPV receiver that mounts on the front of your goggles. The second is the FPV ear unit and the third is the FPV camera itself. Taking a quick look at the headline spec, it is a digital FPV system that supports up to 720p, 60 frames a second. One of the big benefits of this system is that it has a fixed near zero latency. This means that no matter how low the signal gets, the latency will remain the same, which is ideal for racing applications. It works on the 5.8 gigahertz band and has eight channels available. The ground module has HDMI output, which makes it compatible with not only fat shark goggles, but displays from other manufacturers manufacturers and it works with both Betafly and iNav. Taking a closer look at the receiver module first, it's designed to be mounted to the front of a set of Fat Shark goggles, but it can also be used as a standalone unit. On the front, it has two built in patch antennas, and there are two additional SMA ports on the top for connecting more antennas too. There is a built in three way control button for changing the menu and options, and there's also a DC input jack on the side. Moving around to the bottom, you will find a port for updating the firmware, a HDMI output, as well as a slot for the SD card for the DVR. Now, looking on the back, you can see it's molded to be able to fit to the front of a set of Fat Shark goggles, but you can use this as a standalone module with any device with a HDMI input if you want to. One note on the power input on the side, this is designed to take an input of 7.8 volt. Fat Shark provide a cable that works with 2 to 4 S that actually converts that down to 7.8 volt for this unit. Do not directly connect a higher voltage input, otherwise you could do damage. Moving over to the ear unit, this is a dual board module that is 25 by 32 by 12 mil and weighs just 10 grams on its own or 15.4 grams including the camera and cable. It features for the antenna which is MMCX located in the middle on the left hand side as well as an input for updating the firmware on the top. Looking around the module there is also another input for the small joystick board that they include for being able to change settings when the unit is on the ground. As I said, the unit has four inputs and outputs, of which two are for the UART connection for the OSD telemetry, and two are the power input. Now, it supports an input power range of 7 to 26 volts, and that allows it to have a 25 to 500 milliwatt RF output. Whilst it is a little larger than the size, the unit also supports the standard 20 by 20 mounting pattern. Finally, moving over to the camera, this is the Nano HD from Runcam. It features up to 720p 60 frames a second and uses the digital MIPI connector located on the back. The camera simply connects via the port on the back, via the included cable, to the port located between the boards on the ear unit. In the box, you also get various connectors and cables, as well as a little module for controlling the power output and settings on the ear unit as well. That is the main components of the current Sharkbite system. Now, although this ear unit is very small, there is an even smaller one in testing designed for whoops and smaller aircraft again that should be available in the not too distant future, and more cameras are going to be available as well shortly. When you get the system, the first thing you're going to need to do is connect the wires onto the board. Now, I would suggest making sure you do use a little bit of flux on these pads. These are very, very small, so please do take care when you are soldering. You do need to make sure that the nib of your soldering iron isn't too large because it would be easy to damage some components that are located next to them if you slipped. Now, it's four wires in total, two for power and then two for the UART connection. Again, TX and RX, and as you can see, I'm having to use a little bit of flux just to get the wires soldered on but once it's done it's all ready to go and ready to be powered up. 
Now we have the ear unit all assembled, the next thing we're going to do is mount the receiver piece to the goggles. Now before I do that I just want to explain a few things. I've mounted this into a small 3D printed unit which I use for testing. Because this system isn't actually mine is on loan I didn't want to fully bolt it into an aircraft so what I've actually done is 3D printed up this little bracket that allows me to mount it onto any number of aircraft for testing and this is what I've been using it on to be able to actually do the footage testing that I wanted to do was just try the system and get the overall feel for how it is. Now as I showed it comes with this front goggles mounted unit. Now this actually bolts onto the fat shark goggles or screws I should say. You fit this little hinged clip fan cover assembly onto the top and then this actually screws on top of the fan of your goggles and then it allows you to mount the receiver end onto the front just like that. When it is all screwed down in place I'm just going to hold it a second it then allows you to tilt it up and down depending on what position you want it into but the nice thing with this system is is whilst it is designed to actually fit to fat shark goggles you can use it as a standalone and you can use it with any set of goggles that have a HDMI input including the HeadPlay HDs and other things like that but you can also connect it to a monitor to allow your audience to be able to see what you're seeing and rather than fly through goggles you could fly through a display but the overall design of the main unit is designed to bolt onto the front of the Fat Shark goggles and whilst these aren't a set of HDOs it fits exactly the same we simply put it over the top put the four screws in and then it's mounted in place ready to go and then they also include that little HDMI cable on the bottom which simply plugs into the bottom of the unit and plugs into your goggles as well. Now as you can see I've got the HDMI cable installed going from the bottom of the receiver unit to the bottom of the goggles and that simply tucks in nicely underneath. Now powering the unit and the goggles is done slightly differently. They include a couple of cables in the pack and the best one is this longer one here which has an XD60 on the bottom and then it has two DC outputs. One designed to go into the power port on your goggles and the other one designed to go into the power port on the side of the receiver module and that way you're able to power both units from a single LiPo rather than having to mess around with two of them. Now you could still use the head strap option if you wanted to but to be honest whilst using this external unit for the shark bite I would advise using an external LiPo it's just going to give you the best overall battery life for use in the field. So the next thing we're going to do is get this hooked up and actually show you some of the stuff on screen. I'm going to hook it up on the bench and walk you through some of the things such as the menus and how the settings and things actually work as well. Now I also just want to touch on the OSD at this point as well. It is fair to say at this point that the OSD on the SharkBite system is quite limited especially compared to the DJI. But just to explain that DJI are now using the custom OSD option that is available within Betaflight. That has been added later and the DJI system didn't always have the same level of info that it has today and pretty much the same thing stands for the SharkBite system. Here and now it has the basics and it has what you need but there are some things missing and hopefully over time we will see them improve the firmware to add that in the future but again I'll show you some of that on screen as we go through. So to walk through the menu system, now just before I do this I just want to mention this ear unit gets extremely hot. I've got it on a test setup here which I've been using on a couple of other drones rather than building it all in because of the models it was on. I've taken it off and I've put it back on again. But do be aware of the temperature this ear unit can get to. It's frankly scary, I will talk about it a little bit later on. However, if you are using this on the bench, do make sure it's in low power mode and do make sure it's got some airflow going over it. Now, the way I've got it set up here is it does have a bit of airflow, you can't see it, but there is some there and I've been testing it in this without an issue, but do take it into account. Now, first of all, we're gonna walk through the goggles menu or the, the ground station menu, I should say, as part of it, and then we'll take a look at the setting options that are on the ear end. Now we're going to power the goggles up and the ear unit ground station and we'll get it all up and running. And as you can see, when it powers up, you get a SharkBite logo as it boots and then it goes straight into channel scan. Now, because the ear end is turned off, it is simply scanning for the channels and waiting for them to be detected. Now, when it does pick up a channel, it will actually come up on the spectrum analysis and then it will show it connected and we'll take a look at that in a second. Now, just to show you the menus on the ground station, to access, you press and hold the lever and it will then, 
once I do it again, bring up the main menu for the ground unit. It has the option for the scan channels, which is the same thing we just seen. We just need to give it a press. And that enters back into that, so we don't need to worry about that. We then have the option to change the frame rate, whether it be 50 or 60 frames a second, format the SD card for the DVR, HDMI format, whether it be 4x3 or 16x9, playback for when we're playing back footage that we've recorded, reset the unit, or go into the About screen. And if I enter the About screen, you can see here it gives you the firmware version, as well as the Shark Bite and the HD0 information as well. Now, if I go back up and put it on the scan screen, it will sit there waiting for the ear unit to connect. Now, when I actually plug the ear unit in, let me just get this cable in, you'll see that it actually gets picked up on the spectrum display and then it will connect to it automatically once it does another rescan. There we go, you can see boom, and that is it in and up and running. And if I put my hand in front of it, you can see it's all up and running, ready to go. Now, on the ear unit, you have the option of being able to change the settings from within your sticks on your remote when it's connected to a flight controller. I haven't actually been able to get that bit to work for some reason, even when I've wired it all up properly. Or you have the option of connecting up this little board on the back. Now, this doesn't have to stay connected all of the time. You can plug it in and un unplug it when you're not using it, but you can change all of the settings via this as well. Now on here, we have a couple of options. If I press and hold the little joystick down, it will bring up the setup menu, which gives us the picture mode settings, which you can see we can do things like flip the camera, change the brightness, the contrast, the sharpness, the hue, the color gain. We've then got the white balance adjustments, We've got the day night mode, but this doesn't work on this camera. Language, camera reset, and then exit. And that's that main menu. You then, if you press and hold up, it gives us the options to set the scenes on the camera. So we can go personal, matrix door, indoor, cloudy, twilight, personal. We'll go back to outdoor. We've then got sharpness view on and off, which makes the image sharper. We've then got widescreen on and off and the system frame rate, whether it be 50 or 60 frames a second. And then we've got exit. Also on this little joystick, if you press and hold it to the right hand side, you can then also change the scene mode as well. And then we've got the power and channel options, which are under a little button next to the joystick. Now to change the channel, you simply press the button once, which brings up the channel number, and then just keep pressing it through. As you can see, it's gone off the display. And then we'll go back around and that set it on two, which is the channel we're currently set to. Or if we want to change the output power options, you press and hold it until it flashes up and then it flashes up and says one currently, which is on 25 milliwatt. We can then set it to option two, which is actually, let me, what is it? I've lost the 200 milliwatt. And then option three is 500 milliwatt. And that's the maximum output of this ear unit at the moment. So that allows us to switch between those modes. Now, you can, as I've said, have access to this via the stick menu. But as I mentioned, I can't get that to work myself at the moment. Now, that is the main settings menus for it with everything you need to do. There's pretty much no other settings on the system than that. Now, as you can see, we've got it turned on and you can see that gives you an idea of how the camera looks in here in the workshop. It is 720p, 60 frames a second, and that is the image quality that the system is transmitting at at the moment. I've got it obviously with a couple of just uh, cheap antennas tossed on the top here just for testing it in the workshop. Um, and yeah, that's the overall image quality as you can see. Just to quickly show you what the OSD looks like on the bench, I've got it hooked up to iNav and as you can see, this is the main options that are available. Now I haven't put it in any particular order, but you can see that we've got GPS, we've got lat and long, we've got total pack voltage, individual cell voltage, current milliamp hour, disarmed, armed, the percentage of signal RSSI, speed, altitude and things like that. Now, this is heavily dependent on what's supported in either Betaflight or iNav. There's quite a complex subject around this that I'm not going to get into, but basically Fatshark do print in their manual what options are available and what will work. And this is something I would expect to improve in the future, but you can control it just like the DJI system by dragging them around the screen and changing their positions.
what I'm going to do next is walk you guys through some footage from this system out and about. I've had this system on multiple aircraft. I've had it on a wing, I've had it on some drones, and a lot of the flying I had with Sharkbite was actually not being recorded. It was most of my own testing. Unfortunately, winter has now kicked in and it's been pretty much chucking with rain ever since. So the footage I'm going to show you guys next is just some test footage that I've taken just to give you an idea of how the system actually looks out and about. There isn't any specific flying in this, it's just moving around in a field just to give you an idea of how the system can look in general FPV use. There are some things I want to explain as we're going through this footage. Now, as you can see, this is actually windowed. And the reason for that is you might have noticed the odd message on the footage I've showed you earlier. And the reason for that is the Sharkbite is 720p. This video is recorded in 1080p. So just to show you this properly, I have kept it at its 720p resolution, which makes it windowed. Now, this was converted in handbrake. However, it was converted at maximum quality settings. And this is exactly as it has come from the DVR. Now, these flights were done on a very, very windy day. It was just a quick flight to show you how the shark bite system looks out and about. Now, it does look different to the DJI system and it behaves different to the DJI system as well. As you can see there, we're getting a little bit of rain on the display. That is how the shark bite system actually breaks up when the signal is getting low. Now, this is simply just a very basic setup. It hasn't been set up particularly well. Now here, I'm actually flying behind myself just to show you what it looks like when the image does begin to break up. I'm actually beyond the hill on the other side behind me here and you can see it breaks up very similar to old analog and whilst it is digital you can see the individual square pixels it is different to the DJI system in how it handles signal loss. Now overall as you can see the image quality is decent it is clearly digital and it is very clear and it is fairly crisp but it doesn't have quite the same punch the DJI system has but I'll talk about that a little bit more later on. Now this is simply just a few flights around the field and the beach just to give you a feel and a look of how this footage actually is in the real world. Because there is no DVR on the system this is recorded at the ground station DVR not the air end. Now here I have simply upscaled it to the timeline which is the 1080p now and this is it at full screen and not in the windowed view. Again you will see some quality loss as a result of this because it is having to stretch that image now but it just gives you an idea of how the footage looks overall. Anyway that's enough of me talking for this bit I'm just going to let the footage finish. One last thing I just want to mention is you might see a spot up in the top left area of the display there seems to be something on either the lens or the sensor I need to actually strip it to have a look it's not on the outside of the lens it's definitely on the inside it's just something I'll need to take a look at at home but it's not something that's really distracting when flying Told your friend you're not okay And tell me what's wrong and why you never said you felt that way And guess you're trying to stay strong and fake a smile until I look away But I've known you too long, it hurts to watch your blue eyes fade to grey As you fade away, yeah, 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 yeah. As you fade away Yeah, I'm about to fade away. Cause every Just to compare with DJI, because people are going to want to see that. Here, I've recorded it in 4x3, unfortunately. I never noticed I did that. Now, this is DVR footage from the goggles and not from the ear unit itself, because it is unfair to compare ear unit to ground station recordings. So this is the DJI 
FPV footage from the standard ear unit recorded directly on the goggles and it is simply just a quick flight to show you how it looks and then compare it to some footage I recorded on the same day on the Fat Shark. Now just on this Fat Shark footage you will notice that there's a little bit of rain on the display or a dots all over it coming and going. This was because I had a faulty antenna on the system. This is an antenna I had used on the DJI system without any problems and the reason it hadn't given me any problems because it is dual antenna. However, I put that antenna onto this system and I started to get this rain effect all over the footage. It was the antenna. As soon as I swapped it out, as you could see in the other footage, the problem went away. So please do ignore that. This bit of footage is simply to show you a comparison between how it looked compared to the DJI on the same day. Unfortunately, one is in 4x3, one is in 16x9. I can't really do a lot about that now, unfortunately, though. Um, but as you can see, there is that rain. And if you do get this with your SharkBite system, check your antenna connections, check your pigtails, because it is not correct. It shouldn't be doing it at such a short range. Okay, so to give you my thoughts on the Shark Bite system, having spent a bit of time with it. Now, I'm going to split this into three bits. We're going to talk about the ground station, the ear unit, and then I'm going to talk about the overall performance of the system. Now, to talk about the ground station, first of all, overall, I quite like it. When I first seen this, I wasn't particularly convinced about the design. However, having used it on multiple sets of goggles, including the Fat Sharks, it actually works very well. The plus points on this is that it is fairly small and light. The way it fits onto the goggles is quite nice, actually. The weight isn't particularly a problem for me, and the fact it is bolted on the front, it just is completely out of the way. It is good that it has two built-in patch antennas, but you have the SMAs on the top for two externals. I just put some basic antennas on this for my testing. Um, and it does have that HDMI output, and that is a major plus point of this system. Not only does it work with your HDOs, your HDO2s, and the other fat sharks that I've got you with HDMI input, but it will work with any display, another set of HDMI goggles, a monitor, a TV, anything you want to put it on, which means you are not limited to just Fat Shark goggles. You can use it with any other ones as well. Um, so overall on that, it's okay. There are some quirks though with it. I think the power, not the power, sorry, the control switch is a bit funky. It's very Fat Shark if you've used a set of Fat Shark goggles. And the DVR isn't brilliant. It records the footage in a bit of a silly format and I had to edit it before I could actually put it into Resolve and I just feel the DVR is lacking slightly but overall the ground station itself is decent and I do like the power cable setup it does a nice job and there's no problems at all with that. Next moving over to the ear unit now there is a lot to like here but I do have some criticisms of this ear unit specifically now talking about the plus points it is very small and very light especially compared to the DJI one it has a nice solid MMCX connector and it has a decent input voltage range as well whilst it does only support up to 500 milliwatt it is okay it would have been nice to have had dual antennas but really does that make a difference for this kind of thing I'm not convinced it really does in the end. Um, you do have the ability to change the menus, I believe, via your remote controller, although I couldn't get that to work. But you do have the plug-in board for easy settings change as well. Overall, the ear unit is very nice from its size point of view, but that does come as a downside for me as well. And I have three major criticisms of it. The first is just how hot this ear unit gets. I've still got it mounted on this battery tester, uh, which I had it out and about with, and it does get crazy hot. Even on the bench at 25 milliwatt, I was testing components with an infrared thermometer at over 85 degrees C. Yes, before you say it, I know it's designed to have airflow, but it does worry me just how hot this unit gets. Further to that, I am concerned at how brittle it might be. And I don't mean that it's poorly made. I think it's actually very well made. But because all of the components are on such a compact board, because there is no metal or heat sink around it, you could have the potential to damage it if it wasn't enclosed in a frame. And then you've got the thermal issues to contend with. So it is a bit of a balance. I would have liked to see fat 
which are create a very small thermal and sort of protection cover for this. So an aluminium top and bottom that was as small as possible. It might have added a little bit of size, but I do think that would have been a payoff with having for the temperature control and as well as protect in the air unit as well. Who knows, it is something they might do in the future. My third criticism of the air unit is the connections. They are ridiculously small. For someone like me to solder it, it wasn't a massive problem as you've seen early on. However, they are just tiny and they're too close to components on the board that could easily be damaged if you were to slip with a soldering iron. I would much rather that they had a harness output and not those soldering points themselves. I do think that is something that needs some work. The ear unit isn't fundamentally bad, but I do think there are, well, there is some room for improvements on this one, and it will be interesting to see how they develop it over time. With regards to the camera and the cable, I'm more than happy with that. I don't have any problems. The camera is okay. It's not the best in the world, and it's not the worst, and I'm okay with the connection as well. It's the digital connection that we have now, and it'd be nice if the cable was a bit longer, but that can be done. That's not a big issue. It's certainly not something you should mark the system down for. So that's my thoughts on the ear unit itself. Okay, so to give you my final thoughts on the Sharkbite system and the inevitable comparison with the DJI one. Now, I'm going to talk about image quality setup and my plus and downsides overall and what I think. As you can see, I'm in a different t-shirt and that is because I'm recording this a few weeks later because I've had some more time to play with this. I've tried it on multiple other sets of goggles, including a set of HDO2s as well, and I wanted some more time before giving my final thoughts. Now, with regards to image quality, this this system is not as good as DJI, okay? To be clear, it is clearly digital and it is better than analog, but it just doesn't have that punch or that wow factor that the DJI system has when you first put the goggles on. The image quality is good and much of it, I think, could be down to the little run cam camera that is included with it. There is the possibility of us seeing some improvements because there are new cameras in the pipeline for this system and we could see a bump in image quality as those cameras come on board as well. It isn't terrible and I've heard people call it analog or analog plus. I think that's unfair. It's very much better in the goggles than it is on the DVR, especially in something like the HDO2s. I got to spend a couple of hours testing it on the HDO2s. I'd have loved to have spent a lot more time, but they weren't mine. I had to borrow them. But it certainly looks better in person than it does from the DVR. Now, talking about that DVR, as always with the Fat Shark ones, in my opinion, it isn't the greatest and it really doesn't do the system justice either. Um, it is unfair to compare this system to the DJI Air Unit because the Air Unit on the DJI is recording directly to the Air Unit and that gives very good footage. When you are comparing, you have to compare it on goggles footage to goggles footage and there isn't that much in it when you do that. When you look at the DJI Air end unit if footage, it's fantastic. There's no question and it knocks the spots off. But if you do it comparison evenly, there isn't that much in it. It isn't as good as DJI, but it's digital and it's okay. From the way the signal behaves and when it loses signal, I actually really like the breakup on this. It is that fixed very low latency and I could not detect the latency on this system at all. No matter what I did, I just cannot feel it's there. Um, whether that's me, I don't know, but it, for me, it, it's just non-existent, just like it is on the DJI system on the bench. The way it breaks up is interesting. I don't feel it has the same um, penetration as the DJI system, but I won't say that out and out is 100%, because in my tests, it did seem to lose the signal behind some things slightly more than the DJI one did, but that could simply be down to the antennas I'm using. It could be down to the antennas on the ear end. There's too many variables involved. Range is okay. It's not as good as the DJI on out and out range, but it should be added. This is only 500 milliwatts. It isn't as long range as the DJI if you are looking for a max range system, but it is certainly fine for FPV racing. It is certainly fine for general FPV flying within visual line of sight as we're all legally required to within the UK. Now, 
overall from that image and signal it's decent and as I've said the way it breaks up is quite nice I have no problems with that at all. With regards to setup on this system that is one of the big downsides for me. From an ease of use point of view it is quite difficult to set up with those tiny solder pads. The DJI wins the hands down with its out the box compatibility with multiple flight controllers with simple plug and play harness. They need to put a harness connection on this but that can be improved in future units it's not a problem. It is also somewhat lacking in its overall features compared to DJI in the sense of how it controls things but that can be added and it is still early days on the firmware. What I would say is this as a digital FPV system it's got a massive amount of benefits. If you are looking for a FPV system that is digital that has HDMI output it has to be this system from Fatshark. I cannot recommend the DJI one based on having to buy a smart controller that costs five six hundred dollars or pounds. If you are after something that has wide compatibility with existing displays it has to be this system. If you are into racing this system will suit you better than DJI because it has that fixed latency. It has smaller ear units. So there is a lot of benefits. I would say where DJI wins is overall FPV experience, ease of setup, outstanding image quality and the way you're able to just connect it up to flight controllers as I said with that easy setup and get it working. I do think Shark Bite is extremely interesting and it's going to be interesting to see how it develops in the future. It isn't for me one versus the other. I would 100% own both of these systems on different applications. I much preferred this system on fixed wing just because of its size. It was just easier to integrate and it behaved very nicely overall. The DJI one I just found a little bit more awkward even with the Vista simply because of the size but again you do need to take that heat into account with this system. Overall here and now today I think it's an extremely interesting option. Fat Shark have done a decent job. It isn't perfect. I'd like to see the ear unit improved. However I would not be disappointed if I'd have spent my money on this system that's for sure and I'd like to actually try that smaller board in a whoop and stuff because that is really an interesting angle that this system is pushing on as well. Anyway that is it that is my thoughts it gets somewhat of a thumb up from me absolutely interesting very interesting in its applications and how it's going to be developed in the future as well. I hope you have found this video interesting there has been some continuity issues in this one because it was filmed over such a long period of time however I do apologize but hopefully it hasn't been too distracting. Please do let me know in the comments of this video what you think of the shark bite system and give me your thoughts on this video as well. Please give us a like and a share. Thank you for watching. Please do hit that subscribe button and I will release another video on this system maybe or something else in the near future.